Hey now, it's time for another episode of Wrestling's Greatest Moments as we look at Saturday night's main event, a show that played a pivotal role in the WWF's success in the 1980s, but one you might not know all the details about. For example, why was an NBC producer Dick Eversall interested in the show? Or meeting Vince McMahon for that matter? What changed his mind? What did Eversall really think about the show? What made Eversall McMahon? Two men from very different backgrounds become fast friends. How did Ebersol and Vince sneak the show onto the air under NBC's noses? What made Jesse the Body Ventura go off on NBC when he debuted on Saturday Night's Main Event? Sit back as Wrestling's Greatest Moments looks at the story of Saturday Night's Main Event. Once upon a time, WWF fans rarely got to see main event matches on free TV. That changed on May 11, 1985, when NBC broadcast Saturday night's main event, a TV special meant to capitalize on the success of the first WrestleMania. And capitalize it did, with the show becoming a recurring show on Saturday nights. Equally important, the show took the WWF to new levels as it transformed the way the company presented its product on air, paving the way for the WWE's reputation for world-class production values. For some WWE fans, Saturday night's main event may seem like just another wrestling show. After all, fans get to see major matches every week on Raw and SmackDown. However, at the time of its inception, Saturday night's main event was one of the biggest happenings in professional wrestling, an event almost as important as WrestleMania. Saturday night's main event represented not only the success of Vince McMahon's WWF, but that of professional wrestling in general. NBC's airing of Saturday night's main event marked the first time network television broadcast professional wrestling since the 1950s, aka the golden age of professional wrestling. This was the latest sign that pro wrestling had transformed from a fringe form of entertainment into something appealing to the general public. By spring 1985, Vince McMahon's plans for transforming the World Wrestling Federation into a national company were taking shape. McMahon's success with WrestleMania showed the world he was ready to risk everything on his vision of a wrestling company that defied regional boundaries and appealed to a mass audience. Already, several of McMahon's competitors were feeling the sting from his success as they failed to devise a way to overcome his strategy and tactics. Elsewhere, TV producer Dick Ebersol was looking for his next big success. Ebersol had helped to develop NBC's wildly popular late-night comedy show, Saturday Night Live, alongside its creator, Lauren Michaels. When Michaels left the show, Ebersol took over, rescuing it from cancellation. Living life by the motto, the finish line is the beginning of the next race, Ebersol looked for his next success. He found it with NBC's Friday Night Videos. The show capitalized on the success of MTV, airing after 12.30 a.m. Over time, he began to realize that late-night television was an untapped market. The exact circumstances of how Saturday Night's main event came into being are hard to pin down. According to the book Sex, Lies, and Headlocks, Ebersol contacted Vince McMahon and said he'd been watching the WWF product, particularly Tuesday Night Titans. He liked what he saw and thought there were similarities to Saturday Night Live. Another story is that Ebersol's agent, Marty Klein, encouraged him to call McMahon, but Ebersol was unsure. That is, until he ran into David Letterman. Letterman recalled an episode McMahon had participated in for his Late Night with David Letterman show, and he told Ebersol he'd love him when he met him. Ebersol finally gave in, and he met with the WWF boss at NBC's 30 Rock headquarters. On the surface, you'd think Vince and I couldn't have been less alike in our backgrounds, our dispositions, and our interests. But sure enough, we hit it off immediately. What I remember thinking as Vince told me his story in our first meeting was how smart he was and how gutsy he was. For all his outsized public persona, Vince was genuine, soft-spoken, and thoughtful one-on-one -on -one in conversation. Like a lot of kids, I'd watch wrestling from time to time growing up. He also realized how much wrestling was another form of entertainment. But it wasn't until I met Vince that something immediately occurred to me. At the heart of the success of his operation was storytelling. Wrestling was, in effect, a live-action cartoon with pretend heroes and villains and rivalries and feuds, best delivered with a sense of humor and fun. Every one of those elements of the show was part of a story. After meeting with McMahon, 
Eversol realized he could have the same winning formula that made Saturday Night Live such a hit. Could lightning strike twice for NBC's Saturday Night Late Night Time Slot? Eversol hoped to do so by creating an equally successful show. Like many people, he had seen the WWF break into the mainstream, with popular wrestling specials on MTV, Hulk Hogan and Mr. T guest hosting Saturday Night Live, and WrestleMania's incredible success. Eversol had also watched the WWF's Tuesday Night Titans program, a bizarre variety show that incorporated the larger-than-life characters of the WWF. As far as Eversol was concerned, Tuesday Night Titans utilized some of the same elements that made Saturday Night Live popular. Dick Eversol lobbied with NBC's Vice President of Programming, Brandon Tarktikoff convincing him that Saturday Night's main event would bring some of the same fans who enjoyed Saturday Night Live. Brandon was reluctant, but agreed after Ebersol said he would have popular singer Sidney Lauper on the debut episode. Brandon okayed the show, and it was time to see if Ebersol and the WWF could deliver the goods. That is, excellent ratings. Although Ebersol got Tarktikoff's approval, he found the show's development delayed by attorneys. I suggested our lawyers get together and hammer out a development deal, but a few weeks later, when the lawyers were taking too long and making an agreement too complex for his taste, Vince and his wife and partner, Linda, came back to me with a different idea. Why don't we shake out a 50-50 split and get going on figuring out a show already? And that's exactly what happened. Now it was time to get to business producing a show that would build off the WWF's growing popularity. Like many new programs, the show had its share of speed bumps, including a clash of culture between NBC and the WWF. Could these two different worlds mesh successfully? While Ebersol was impressed with the creative aspects of the WWF product, he realized that production-wise, the WWF shared something with the Saturday Night Live cast and that they both weren't ready for prime time. As detailed in Sex, Lies, and Headlocks, Ebersol felt that the production values hadn't changed much since the 50s. Vince's MTV shows didn't impress him, and WrestleMania struck him as downright primitive. There would be no more showing up at an arena with a single truck carrying a ring and some lights. Ebersol wanted four cameras at ringside with boom mics to catch the grunts and groans that usually went unheard. He wanted state-of-the-art lighting rigs. He wanted concert-quality sound. Utilizing his years of experience in network TV, Ebersol's improvements helped the WWF polish its TV product to an unheard level of quality. Ebersol's influence not only transformed the WWF's production values, but that of professional wrestling in general. Once fans saw the fantastic production values of Saturday Night's main event, they expected the same from every wrestling show. Overnight, the era of recording wrestling TV in old studios in front of a small audience became an endangered species as the WWF instituted a new standard. There's also a butting of heads between NBC officials and wrestlers. Jesse the Body Ventura, the show's color commentator, was stunned when he saw that a script had been written for him for calling the matches. During an appearance on Steve Austin's podcast, Jesse recalled, Who in your staff of writers is qualified to write for Jesse the Body Ventura? I know wrestling. They don't. You have no one who can write for me. Ebersol's commitment to the success of Saturday Night's main event reflected the fact that he was gambling his reputation on the show. NBC guaranteed a certain rating for advertisers who aired commercials during the time slot in which Saturday Night Live aired. If Saturday Night's main event's ratings did not match the number guaranteed by NBC, the network would have to pay a penalty back to advertisers for the difference. If Saturday Night's main event was a failure, Ebersol's star at NBC could quickly plummet. With so much riding on the success of the first show, everything was done to make it a must-see TV event. The WWF packed the show with its top talent, including Hulk Hogan, The Junkyard Dog, Robbie Roddy Piper, The U.S. Express, Mike Rotundo and Barry Windham, Ricky Steamboat, and Wendy Richter. In addition to the cream of the WWF crop, Saturday night's main event's inaugural show featured guest appearances by celebrities Cindy Lauper and Mr. T. With Saturday night's main event airing roughly six weeks after WrestleMania, McMahon wisely booked several follow-up matches from his first pay-per-view, including a Hulk Hogan Bob Orton bout, a Wendy Richter vs. Fabulous Moolah rematch for the Women's Championship, and an edition of Piper's Pit featuring Paul, Mr. Wonderful, or North, who had recently turned babyface. 
Ultimately, the first edition of Saturday Night's main event was a complete success, exceeding the expectations of both Ebersol and the higher-ups at NBC. The show outdrew the ratings Saturday Night Live pulled in during the same time slot, opening the door for more editions of Saturday Night's main event. Over the next five years, Saturday Night's main event would air several times a year on NBC's Late Night Saturday lineup as special programming. Saturday Night's main event was equally important for the WWF, giving the promotion access to a national audience of new fans. Vince McMahon would use the show as a platform to launch new angles for the WWF with the hope of luring fans to his, his then-budding pay-per-view products. A large part of the show's appeal was due to the fact that it featured wrestling lineups that fans typically would have to buy a ticket to see. When Saturday Night's main event first aired, fans were used to seeing nothing but squash matches on regular WWF television, the idea being that fans would be forced into buying a ticket to see big-name wrestlers face one another in the ring. With Saturday Night's main event, fans could see championship matches and specialty matches such as a cage match that they'd never before seen on television. Indeed, the program featured many angles that fueled WWF storylines, often in order to build up matches at live events and pay-per-views. Angles such as King Kong Bundy injuring Hulk Hogan, Jake the Snake Roberts DDTing Ricky Steamboat on the cement, or Mr. T boxing Bob Orton in a setup to WrestleMania II, Saturday Night's main event featured plenty of action, if not classic wrestling. The quirky wrestling show didn't hesitate to capitalize on the silliness that was par for the course with the WWF programming. Segments such as a hillbilly wedding between Uncle Elmer and his bride, a Halloween party with wrestlers attired in various costumes, announcer Mean Gene Okerlund searching the Detroit Zoo for George the Animal Steel, or Alfred Hayes on a safari, Saturday Night's main event didn't hold back on the zaniness that turned off some traditional fans, but also brought in casual fans and even non-fans. The spectacular success of Saturday Night's main event impacted the wrestling industry for years to come. From the fans' perspective, the arrival of Saturday Night's main event met a higher level of expectations, both in terms of production values they saw on TV, as well as the quality of matches that aired. From the WWF's perspective, there was a realization of how big the market could be for their product. Not surprisingly, the success of Saturday Night's main event fueled the WWF's success in other ventures, primarily pay-per-view. Saturday Night's main event proved to be the next step in how promoters did business. For decades, promoters ran shows on local TV stations that served as advertisements for its house shows, aka live events. Now, the WWF had 90-minute advertisements that reached a national audience, driving up interest in the company's house shows and pay-per-views. Dick Ebersol's gamble paid off well for both him, as well as for Vince McMahon and the WWF. Ebersol's position at NBC improved naturally, and Vince McMahon steered the WWF to new heights of success, partially on the back of Saturday night's main event. The Ebersol-McMahon collaboration's rating success cut the eye of NBC executives, who commissioned an annual primetime wrestling show called The Main Event, which ran from 1988 to 1991. The show also created a bond of friendship between Ebersol and McMahon that continues to this day. Ebersol was proud that his handshake agreement with McMahon was all he needed. McMahon, for his part, made sure Ebersol received every cent he was entitled to. Vince and I never signed a contract. I would send him 50% of the production fee from NBC that we got for the show and figured that was that. But nine months after our first batch of shows that aired, I got a surprise. The first of many checks in the mail at my house in Connecticut for half the profits of everything that came out of Saturday night's main event, like t-shirts, hats, and profits from international syndication. No business managers necessary that McMahon's had been totally true to their word. Years later, Dick Ebersol partnered with Vince McMahon on a less successful venture, the XFL. The would-be alternative to the NFL only lasted one season, losing millions for McMahon and NBC. However, their friendship endures. Saturday Night's main event aired on NBC from, from 1985 to 1991, when NBC canceled it due to low ratings. Fox picked the show up for two episodes in 1992, but by then wrestling was in a slump, and the impressive numbers from the early years were no more. NBC brought the show back in 2006, but it couldn't match the success of the original and only lasted five episodes before disappearing in 2008. The wrestling world had changed. 
Although Saturday night's main event still featured competitive matches, fans could find them every week on the WWE's weekly primetime programs. Saturday night's main event had become a piece of nostalgia, and in this case, the nostalgia didn't translate into ratings. What do you think of Saturday night's main event and its legacy? Did you ever watch any of the episodes or attend them? If so, what did you think? Share your thoughts in the comments section and let us know if there are any videos you'd like Wrestling's Greatest Moments to cover. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and spread the good news about Wrestling's Greatest Moments, the channel that celebrates the squared circle.